We are particularly thrilled to have Christopher Volpe join us from New Hampshire to talk about his artwork and the exhibit loomings that it is at Canio's right now. And it, it just seemed like the perfect blend of uh, artistic uh, sensitivity, social and environmental uh, consciousness that Christopher brings to his work that we bring to, that we like to feel we bring to our customers and to the broader world with the Moby Dick Marathon. So some of you may already know Christopher, but for those of you who don't, he, he's an artist and a writer. He has an MFA in writing uh, and he's also a teacher. Uh, Chris approaches, uh, his painting approach approaches nature less as a visual motif and more as a site of introspection and metaphor. Um, he has shown his work nationally and it is currently in a number of collections, including Smith College and Whistler House Museum, as well as a number of private collections. Uh, Chris has received grants and awards from numerous uh, organizations, including Mass MoCA, Asset for Arts, and the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts Artist Advancement Grant. So he's gone to school here on Long Island at Stony Brook. He grew up here on Long Island and brings that sensitivity to his own work. He teaches paintings up and down, or at least all around in, in the New England coast. And we are pleased to have him joining us tonight from New Hampshire. Uh, let's, uh, I will say before we give a warm welcome that after Chris's presentation, you will be able to have uh, ask questions. And so if you wanna drop in the chat questions that you might have, we will get that afterwards. So now everybody, if you wanna give a very warm Zoom welcome to Christopher Volpe, please do so. <laughs> Take it away. Thanks everyone. Um, it's really nice to be talking to Canios, talking to all of you. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, I was uh, raised on Long Island and I always uh, looked east toward Canios as a kind of beacon of culture um, as, as an aspiring poet. Everyone, uh, I always wanted to uh, read at Canios, and it was a big, it's a big thing among us. Uh, so it's kind of a, a neat, kind of full circle for me to be now, you know, connecting with you guys. It's really, um, and it's it's really a reflection too of my journey as an artist, um, having started in literature and become enamored of painting and experimented in this and that and. Um, all along the way, people sort of asked me, so when are you, well, you studied poetry. Are you going to start incorporating poetry into your painting? And I was sort of like, didn't have an answer for that. I wasn't sure, like, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not crazy about the paintings I've seen that do that. And it always felt to me that literature and uh, and visual art are, you know, are different, but I've I've come to see them as very much the same, very much united. And this series, Loomings, uh, based on, uh, well, not based on Moby Dick, but um, inspired by Moby Dick, was for me the return of the prodigal son to literature. And uh, it's really great to be, you know, talking with a bunch of literary aficionados here, folks who are familiar with Melville and the book, um, and hope to explain a little bit about how I came to, to all of this. Um, so I have a presentation that I'm gonna share that I'm gonna talk through. And I will also be reading a few excerpts from the book that I have put together that goes along with this exhibition, uh, also called Loomings, and which is uh, available at Canio's. Um, can everybody see the, uh, the presentation that I'm putting up here? Yes, good, good, good. All right then. Um, so, uh, Catherine mentioned that I went to uh, that. You know, I, I don't know if she mentioned it or not, but that I, I I went to school in Long Island too. And in while well, I was in Stony Brook, uh, out on the East End uh, or close to it, I took a class on Melville and Whitman, and I was an English major, obviously. And uh, I was I was a bit. Um, I mean, I took basically I took it because I was a Whitman fanatic, loved Whitman, didn't know a lot about Melville. Uh, and 
I found it difficult to get through Moby Dick. To me, that was it was a uh, a kind of confusing and at times infuriating book uh, because I couldn't I couldn't quite grasp what was going on. What was he doing? Um, and so it wasn't until a few years later, many years later, actually, a few years ago, when I reread the book, that it suddenly spoke to me in a way it never had before. And something, uh, I think that um, Nathaniel Philbrick had a little bit to do with that as well. Uh, he wrote a book called Why Read Moby Dick. He's also the guy who wrote um, In the Heart of the Sea, which is about the Essex, which they also made a movie of. Uh, and the Essex was, the, was, as many of you know, probably know, the historical basis for Moby Dick, uh, a, a sperm whale that rammed a ship, um, it took it down and uh, the consequences of that. And um, we know that uh, Melville uh, was aware of the story and that it influenced him. Um, and so this is a very small book by, by Nathaniel Philbrick, but it's absolutely a gem. If you want to fall in love with Moby Dick again, uh, this is the book for you. Um, he, he makes, he, he brings, well, what I love, um, one, of the, one of the phrases that comes out of this book that I love is that he says, Moby Dick contains the DNA of America. That is it in a nutshell. And it is, um, it, he, he takes you on a tour of why it's a wonderful adventure story, but so much more than an adventure story. I was talking to somebody yesterday and I said like, I said, Moby Dick is, uh, and it's more than an adventure story, the way Hamlet is more than a ghost story or a gore tale <laughs> where everybody dies, right? You know, it's, Chris, if I could interject, first of all, I thought that quote was fantastic. Uh, but secondly, I wonder, we see your slide presentation with the slides on the side and I wonder if it might make sense to open it up so we just see the, the individual slide. Um, I'll leave that up to your Oh, sure. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. How's that? Is that different or the same? That's good. That's great. Okay, Perfect. cool. Great. So what Philbrick does is he shows you the way that shows you ways in which Moby Dick is an allegory of the American character. Basically, here's a here's a quote from him. Um, let's, I have to move, I'm sorry, one more thing. I have to move you guys off to the side here so I can see the full slide. I have, you're covering up a little bit. So hold on. Come here. All right. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Hold on. Well, I will just go for it. Listen to every word contained in the pages of Moby Dick is nothing less than the genetic code of America. So all the, all the problems, the conflicts and ideals that contributed to the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and that continue to what he says, drive this country's ever contentious march into the future. That is what Moby Dick is about uh, for me. It's about, it's a mythos to me. It's, an, it's a foundational myth of America. It's a cautionary tale for uh, a, a capitalist society um, smitten with material things uh, and heedless of um, the consequences of um, endless progress, this dream of endless progress. And, uh, and he, uh, Melville makes sure that we know that um, Moby Dick is about, a, is a commercial voyage. In the first couple chapters, uh, first few chapters, he introduces us to the, to the ship's owners. Owners of the Pequod are these Quakers. And they're basically parodies of uh, religious hypocrisy and because, because they're completely callous about the, and totally unfair and exploitative of the crew and only is, interested in money. Uh, and the um, here's some here's some other ways in which um, Moby Dick becomes symbolic of America. In the Pequod, there are 30 crew members, and there were 30 states in the Union at the time. Pequod is named for a um, a Native American people 
decimated um, by uh, settlers. Um, Melville says it's a ship whose wood could only be American. Um, race is a huge, whiteness is a huge uh, lens in this. He talks about, uh, um, there's a wonderful um, character named Pip, who is kind of like the holy fool uh, that you'd find in a, um, in a tragedy by uh, Shakespeare. And he, he's sort of prophetic as well as kind of um, pure. And he says uh, somewhere in his, uh, in his distress, he looks to this big white God somewhere out in yon darkness to have mercy on this small black boy down here. And Melville's just holding a mirror to American society. Ahab's a demagogue. And the whole story is about self-destruction. It's about um, humans' attempts to dominate nature at our own peril. At least that's how it struck me. Uh, and so this is an example of um, the work from Loomings um, that I've been doing. This is called Westward. And I'm thinking of the West uh, in, in, the gen in general terms here. Um, and this is oil, tar, and gold leaf on wood. So that, that could be the Pequod there. Um, but I also kind of thought with this particular one, it, it kind of could resemble a, uh, an oil tanker too, some sort of tanker ship. And so that was, that's, that was the sweet spot I was going for. It was, a, it was a dovetailing this tale of uh, the, the exploitation of oil, oil from the sea uh, through hunting and killing of these you know, magnificent animals, whales, dovetailing that with what we're doing with fossil fuels, also on a self-destructive mission. So uh, using tar, and I'll get to um, how that happened, um, I found, it, I love that it has this, this um, resonance with fossil fuels, because it is a, pet, is, a, is a byproduct of petroleum refinement, um, but it also is, is a very primal uh, substance that I find just challenging in itself and symbolic in its own way of uh, sort of unknowing. And I'll get, to, I'll get to more of that. So how this happened, how I came to use it, has to do with um, an actual uh, painting that is described in Moby Dick. Uh, Ishmael walks into an inn, Spouter Inn, and sees a, sees a, uh, a, a big painting on the wall, and he can't really tell what it is. And he describes it this way. Such unaccountable masses of shades and shadows, delineation of chaos bewitched, a boggy, soggy, squitchy picture, truly, with a sort of indefinite, half-attained, unimaginable sublimity. And he goes on to speculate what it might be about because he, it's just this sort of abstract, nebulous thing. And he says, okay, maybe it's the Black Sea in a midnight gale, or it's the unnatural combat of the four primal elements of that idea, the elements at war with themselves. It's a blasted heath, a Hyperborean winter scene, the breaking up of the ice bound stream of time. So I found this kind of fascinating and um, as a painter, I started wondering like, what would that look like? Could I paint that? I mean, I wonder if anybody's tried to paint that. So I did some searching online and uh, I found some, uh, I found some blogs where people were speculating about this, this imaginary painting that Melville describes. And some folks said it might be a Turner because Melville actually owned prints of Turner, including the one on the bottom right here. He owned this, uh, this is a, um, a steamship in a snowstorm by uh, Jam W. Turner. And uh, it, it, it answers pretty well to that description of sort of this swirling mayhem. Um, another uh, another um, candidate for having painted this, the picture in the spatter in uh, would be Albert Pinkham Ryder. And um, Ryder was um, born in New Bedford, which is where the Spouter Inn is supposed to be. And um, I'd, been, I'd been studying Ryder anyway, because Jackson Pollock identified him as the only American master who interested him. Um, and the reason for that is because, it, I think, is that he, he didn't paint what he saw so much as he painted 
states of consciousness. His paintings are visual equivalents of uh, metaphysical ideas, right? And I think Pollock appreciated them as expressive objects rather than showing, you know, a, a perfect ship. They showed this idea of a ship and the grip of nature. And that's a recurring motif in riders. This is the ships in, uh, in these stormy moonlit seas. So, and, um, oh, and I, I want to mention about Ryder too. Ryder was rumored to have used all kinds of bizarre substances in his paintings. He was the recluse, late 19th century guy. I lived in a tiny apartment in New York City and uh, people said he used blood and tobacco juice and alcohol and, um, and tar in his paintings. And that that's why ultimately his paintings sort of fell apart as they have. Um, famously, uh, they started, some of them started to deteriorate during his own lifetime. And, but the real reason was that he just was completely heedless about um, piling up substances on top of each other without any sense of like what was gonna dry first. So he'd put something down, three years later, he'd put something on top of it and the thing below it would dry, uh, the thing on top would dry before the thing below. Then eventually the thing below would cause the top thing to crack and then he'd put more stuff on top of it and basically it was just disastrous. But he didn't actually use tar. They said he did, but he didn't. But I thought he had. And so I was thinking about tar in painting. I'm thinking about using tar. Look how interesting that would be um, when I read Moby Dick. And I also had these things floating around in my head. So um, I love, I've always loved the work of Franz Klein. I was living on Long Island. I used to go to the Met and the Modern and I would be bewitched by the abstract expressionists. I just loved the work and I understood it for some reason. And Franz Klein really spoke to me. Um, his black and white paintings, are just dramatic to me. Um, but there's another guy in England, John Virtue, and his works above there, uh, who also paints in black and white, always doing landscapes. And when I saw John Virtue, I was like really taken with him too. And I wanted to I wanted to do something like that, something in that chiaroscuro, that dramatic black and white uh, but on a large scale, perhaps not completely abstract like Klein, but maybe doing to do with landscape. And basically, the reason this is all relevant is because it all came together in my idea for making that picture that Melville described. Here's uh, the end of that passage about the painting. But what most puzzled and confounded you in the painting was a long, limber, portentous black mass of something hovering in the center of the picture over three blue perpendicular lines floating in a nameless yeast. In fact, the artist's design seemed this. The picture represents a Cape Horner, a ship going around the horn in a great hurricane. The half foundered ship weltering there, being overcome with waves with its three masts alone, alone visible and an exasperated whale purposing to spring clean over the craft is in the enormous act of impaling himself upon the three mastheads, which is a crazy surreal image. And this is why Moby Dick is such a great book. It's filled with these bizarre little nuggets that once you start thinking about them, it's like, what, really? Uh, okay, a whale jumping over a ship and becoming impaled on the masts. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try to do it. So this was my answer to that description. This is my painting of the Spouter Inn. This was the first tar painting I did. And it was completely uh, in response to that passage in Moby Dick and my thinking about also uh, John Virtue and wanting to do, and Klein, wanting to do something in black and white, but not wanting to copy things that had already been done. So hence the tar came in. I said, ah, I'll use tar, just like Ryder did. And this will all make sense. And it, I'm still not sure if it does, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, there you can see the, the portentous black mass in the center there and the three masts, if you look closely and barely see the ship being overcome by the nameless yeast that's going on there. So that was my answer to that. 
Um, I did another one that was a bit more like some of the John Virtue. You can see in the top right there, this John Virtue piece, but mine is a seascape, which is barely visible ship on the horizon there on the right. If you can see it, it's, it's pretty fuzzy and small. Um, it's called Fata Morgana because that's a, a, a term for an illusion that occurs that, uh, at sea where um, the, over the horizon, a landmass appears that isn't really there. And uh, one of the things I like about Moby Dick that I wanted to respond to in these paintings is the idea that we never really can know reality. It's a recurring theme in the book. It's, it's subtle, uh, but it's from beginning to end. He, um, Ahab talks about the inscrutable thing that he hates. And that means the thing you can't figure out it's the mystery that it's the Gordian knot that you can't untie. And that's, there's a kind of existential uh, dread in Moby Dick of the unknowable that comes. That's the whole whiteness of the whale chapter is about that too. It's sort of the blank of reality that without our subjective participation becomes a kind of wall that we can't get beyond. Um, and so, the unknowable, the inscrutable was something that I, I was interested in trying to portray in these paintings too. So therefore they're, they're somewhat obscure, they're dark, kind of like the, kind of like the, the, the um, Spouter Inn painting. Uh, you can't tell what they are right away and that's on purpose. This one was one of the, uh, one of the next ones I did and it's a larger painting. I, I, I really liked this idea of the tar and, the, and Moby Dick um, and uh, so, I, I, I decided this is going to be a series. This is the first time I started working in a series. And I said, I decided that I will title every one of these paintings with a quote from Moby Dick. So this one's called Any Human Thing. And the quote is, I promise nothing complete because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. Well, here you go. I mean, that's it again, the inscrutability, the unknowableness of reality. And that's what I wanted to mirror. When I did this one, uh, it, it was, um, it's a subtractive method. It was, I painted the entire surface with tar and then removed paint from the center. And uh, as I did so, it struck me as, um, as a seascape with this, or, with this strange sort of you know, light coming down in a, in a storm. And so I put in the ship, which I hadn't, planned from the beginning, but that's a close-up of the ship. It's done with big brushes, just dipped in tar. And the tar I use is, uh, is roofing tar, same things you use to seal a roof. And I have to treat it with some things so that it dries fully. Um, this is a, a little baby version of the same painting that I did specifically for the show at Canios. And it's Any, any Human Thing number five. And I, I've taken to using antique frames for these too, because of the, the ninth, it's already a ninth, the motif is 19th century. So I, I've, I don't know why, but somehow the, the frames seem to add something to it. Maybe the idea of time, you know? So the tar looks black, but it's really a, um, a, a very dark brown and, as I showed you here, um, I wanted to show that the, there's very little um, paint in this. It's mostly tar. It's dark tar on the outside, but then where I remove the tar in the middle, the light shines through and it, it becomes this wonderful sepia tobacco-like tones to it. The only paint in here is, the, is just mixed a little bit in the white that's coming down, the light that's coming down on top of the ship. Notice, by the way, the light doesn't quite reach the Pequod. That's intentional too. It's the promise of salvation, but will it be fulfilled? As I was making this series too, I was learning about climate change. This was 2015, 2016, and it was just when I was first beginning to, to really look into the science uh, behind the behind the, the, the claim of 
climate change and uh, was appalled by what I saw and couldn't believe that, uh, um, yeah, it's true. <laughs> we really are destroying a planet and we're, we're grave danger. Um, and it occurred to me that there, I, there was a parallel between the Pequod going after whale oil and being destroyed and America and the Western world going after and fossil fuel industry, going after petroleum oil and potentially being destroyed. And that the tar itself could be a signifier for that. In fact, it's not even a fanciful uh, joining. There's a real continuity between whaling, whale oil. It was the first American global industry, like a first industry with which America took global dominance. Um, and uh, the oil was literally used to grease the machinery uh, at the onset of the industrial revolution. So there's a very real connection to, uh, to climate change here. I don't, I, know, I don't think I have to go into the specifics of climate change for you because I have a feeling many of you on the call are aware um, the, I'll just say that the new IPCC report out from the United Nations recently is the, the most dire yet. And they're finally sort of admitting that we're probably not going to be able to hold the, the global temperature rise uh, below 1.5 degrees centigrade above the, um, at the beginning of the industrial era, which they date to the 1800s, but it really should be dated to the 1700s. Um, there are scientists who, uh, who, who dispute the timeline and say we're actually closer to two already. And that if we surpass two, other feedback, global feedback will kick in, uh, melting, the permafrost will melt, which will release more, uh, even worse um, greenhouse gases that will trap more carbon. Uh, and in turn cause more ice to melt, which leaves more dark ocean to absorb more heat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we still may be sort of living in a fairy tale, believing that um, uh, you keep in, they keep, we keep hearing the phrase, if we immediately stop all fossil fuels use, you know, no, that's not gonna happen, <laughs> you know? I mean, at best, we're gonna stop in like 30 years. By then, who knows how late it will be in the game. Um, it's a very troubling uh, situation that we're in. So I tried to image that a little bit with these, these tumultuous forces and these literal seas and skies made of tar, made of fossil fuel stuff. This one is called To Gallant Sails. And there's a wonderful uh, quote um, I have, I have a copy of the, of the book Loomings here with me. And this book contains uh, and a couple essays I've written on this subject and also um, reproductions of many of the paintings in this series, along with uh, quotes from Moby Dick. And the one that is linked to this painting, I'll read, it's just um, beautiful prose. And here it is. Ahab commanded the tagallant sails and royals to be set and every stun sail spread. The best man in the ship must take the helm. Then with every masthead man, the piled up craft rolled down before the wind. The strange upheaving lifting tendency of the taffrail breeze filling the hollows of so many sails made the buoyant hovering deck to feel like air beneath the feet. While still she rushed along as if two antagonistic influences were struggling in her, one to mount direct to heaven the other to drive yawningly to some horizontal goal. So there's that tension between aspiration to heaven and the being pulled back down to the earthly. And I feel that in our society everywhere. And I feel it in the substances I'm using, the tar that wants to pull us down into dissolution and the gold and the, the light that wants to, wants to bring us up. So I've, I like the how I I have um, in this particular painting. I've got those, I've got opposing forces above and below the ship. But I also wanted to show that this is largely based on a composition by Albert Pinkham Ryder. There on the on the left is the canal from 1890. That's where I got that uh, that um, composition. 
so you can see the kinship. Um, there's a wonderful exhibition of Albert Pickham Ryder's work at the New Bedford Whaling, Whaling Museum right now, um, up here in New England. And uh, it's rare that we get to see his work outside of Washington, DC. There's a lot of it in the, in the uh, gallery there, National Gallery. Um, that up, upper right hand uh, image is also from Ryder. And again, it's the, it's the ship on a, on, a, on a dark sea. That's the motif. This was a, this is probably the most um, descriptive, I think, of the paintings in the series, the most realistic, uh, a ship in, in, in trouble, all tar. There's no, no paint on this, um, just tar wiped, put down, wiped away, and then put back again for the details. This is, the latest one I've done, and I consider it probably one of the closest to realizing the core idea behind the whole series. I'm calling it Any Human Thing, number four, The Whaler as Derek. Um, for a while through these, I, I noticed that the dark was kind of coming down from the sky and connecting to the ship, the ship there on the right, got these clouds that look like they're coming down. And, and I, I like thought of that as the darkness kind of coming for uh, coming for us for the ship of state, but it also looks like it. But I also thought of it as um, there's there's something called trying out, which is in Moby Dick. There's a whole chapter on it, which is where they would process the blubber of the whale right on board the ship, and it's a dark and um, gruesome, smelly, sooty process and Melville describes it almost like devils uh, dancing around a hellfire um, and he talks about this black smoke billowing from the ship which to me also feels like industrialism you know this you know belching of black smoke and in fact the ships whaling ships were described as floating factories they were the first they were the models for, for factories uh, and so I thought of this as what if that? What if the ship were also a derrick, and that's oil, um, crude oil, spewing out as it's pulled out of the ground, and it, it, that's what it does. It, it comes out in a massive fountain like that, a fantail, and then comes flowing back down uh, to earth. And so, to me, this one, it's got it all. It's got the, um, it's got the oil. And it's got the sootiness of it. It's got the 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 dire, um, dark, um, and it's got the whaling ship. It's all there. So anyway, uh, that's the. I'm still I'm still trying to get the the full masterpiece, of course. But you know, so far this is as close as I've come. Um, so just a, I have just a few more images that I can show you uh, here that are um, most of these are on. Um, display at Canio's right now. This is called Corpus Sancti. Um, there's a wonderful chapter in Moby Dick where uh, the the uh, St. Elmo's fire comes into the rigging of the ship. And uh, the way it's described is um, an almost biblical event. Uh, Look aloft, cried Starbuck. The St. Elmo's lights. Corpusants, the corpusants. Uh, each of the three tall masts was silently burning in that sulfurous air like three gigantic wax tapers before an altar. The altar being, I guess, a satanic one since the air is sulfurous. So this is identifying Ahab with, uh, you know, sort of the, the Lord of Darkness and the, and the ship on, an, on a, uh, a, a damned and uh, evil mission. Um, here's one uh, that I used with, and this is not a Canios, but um, there will be a version of this at Canios. It's on its way. This one is uh, uh, was the, one of the first ones I used gold leaf in. And the way that happened was uh, very serendipitous. A friend of mine walked into my studio and we were talking about the paintings. And it was at such an, there's a reflective quality to the tar. Sometimes it it um, it's very glossy when it dries. And so he's, he saw it reflecting light and asked, oh, is that gold leaf that you're using in there? And I said, no, but that's a great idea. 
Uh, and so that's how I started incorporating the leaf. And um, I love it because it's also a, a signifier for capitalism, right? You've got the the tar of fossil fuels uh, that pulling us down and then the dazzle of gold, the promise of the Western empire to, you know, to draw us on. And uh, somebody also told me it looks, it kind of, sometimes it looks like the, uh, the cosmos is like collapsing or falling or raining down on, which I love that idea. I've been, I've been trying to play that up. Another um, theme in that I've been doing is a tiny ship on a massive sea of tar. And these are called horizon sails. And I've done like a dozen of them. And uh, this was another, uh, another, this is one of the largest pieces of the whole series. And it represents uh, an underwater scene. It's hard to know what exactly is being shown. Um, but I did like the, uh, I called it dive, but I like the quote, O oh, Ahab, what shall be grand in thee? It must needs be plucked from the skies and dived for in the deep and featured in the unbodied air. So I liked how this painting Tried to, I tried to, to sort of deride the line between the celestial and uh, maybe the aquatic, you know, diving and, and the skies. Um, and this is one of the most abstract ones and it's called, Yes, the World's a Ship on its Passage Out. Uh, here we are. So a few more um, images from the collection of Canios, Westward the Pequod, Um, westward number 14, oil, tar, and gold leaf. Westward 16 and 15, oil and gold leaf and antique frames. Here's that image, I, uh, that theme, I, theme within a theme I mentioned, horizon sails. So it's the little ship on the vast horizon, but this one it's, this one is quite explicitly tar or oil uh, that is, has polluted the sea, a sea of tar. And two others also with the same, same theme. Um, so again, I see, I, I see painting the way I see literature as a uh, a conduit for feeling and emotion and idea. Uh, and I wanted my paintings um, to be more than just pictures. I wanted them like poetry to be also to have something to say about the world at large, um, the way I think Moby Dick does. Uh, and the way Melville makes clear that, um, you know, he says by, the, by that same image, we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. It is the ungraspable phantom of life. And this is the key to it all. I'm happy to take questions and uh, continue the discussion. Stop my share. Here you go. Chris, thank you. That was remarkable. And your work is so arresting and strikes a chord in strikes many chords. Um, I'll say as an artist, it must be so very gratifying for you to be able to blend your artistic capabilities with, you know, what you see in the book and want to bring to, to life. Um, I'm thinking of equivalence, which uh, Stieglitz, the photographer, uh, worked on. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but the dive yeah painting you just showed us, which is evocative of the cloud, he did a whole series of clouds where, you know, his goal was similar to you to, you know, have an emotion be the equivalent of what was on the, um, on the photograph and on the painting. So yeah. anyway. I, he, that's great. I, uh, as a painter, I was, uh, before I found this series, I, I painted a lot of uh, tonal, what they call tonalistic landscapes. And Stiglitz was one of the, one of the models for me, that equivalent series. Uh, fantastic stuff and um, definite, definite uh, continuous of the line. And, and yeah, that was at the time when photography was it, in its infancy as an art. And it was very much tied into the, uh, the evocative, right? The, the suggestive, the poetic even. Right. 
you know, and the whole pictorialist group. But we won't we won't go down that uh, path for the moment. Uh, what I, I'd ask folks to do, if you'd like to ask a question, if you could just you know put it in your name or just put put stack in the chat, and we can call on you. Uh, Christine Copeland has a couple of interesting questions, so uh, I'll ask her to unmute herself, and if she would ask Chris the questions, please. Hi, Chris. Hi, <laughs> And nice to see you again. Um, I was wondering what it sounded like when you were discussing your different paintings that you had a number of dis different supports, you know, so you would canvas on wood. I was wondering if you could describe those and what was under the tar because it, it was so luminescent, you know, when you scraped away, I guess, when you scraped away the tar, what were you using underneath? And how did you thin your tar? What did you use? Turpentine? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I buy the tar from Home Depot and it's just a gallon jar, a jug, you know, um, bucket really. Uh, and, but, and it isn't a liquid form. I don't have to heat it or anything. Um, the, the thing that the real challenge of it, it, well, there's, there's lots of challenges of it, but the, one of the things about it is that it doesn't really want to dry. So I simultaneously thin it and get it to dry by using um, dryers that you would use with oil paints like Liquin or um, uh, Cobalt dryer, things that you, because it, luckily the tar that I use, it, it, it's, it is an oil base, it's not water based. So it will play with oil paints and you can use the same solvents, et cetera. You mentioned turpentine. It's like kryptonite for tar. It's weird. Like even like when you have when you have oil paint that dries, good luck with turpentine trying to get it off. You're gonna have to scrape it first. Um, but with tar, when it's dry, turpentine, if I rub it enough with turpentine, it will dissolve. So the stuff like really responds to turpentine. Um, and I take advantage of that. So I sometimes use turpentine when I'm when I'm thinning it to scrape it away, but but I but I try not to use too much. Um, because like I said, it'll, it'll just completely take it away. So it, it has its own set of rules, um, different from the oils. As far as supports, I mostly have just been using canvas with um, regular acrylic gesso under it. So the luminosity just comes from the whiteness underneath. Um, and, but I've tried, it's all it's all kind of an ongoing experiment you know i'm still trying to figure out what works best and what will work best in the long run um like will that will it crack eventually i don't know will it flake off um, will it melt I, I just i don't know um i hope not i don't think so um so far i haven't seen any evidence of anything like that which is which is heartening um and i think that what so i've been i've been thinking about i I've been talking to a few other artists that are using tar as well. And one of them recommended using an auto, like a car primer, auto paint as a primer underneath it, um, because that stuff's like impenetrable and which isn't a bad idea. So I, uh, I got some, I, I got some, uh, some of that at, at Home Depot and I've been white primer for car painting and just spraying it onto wood, bring it onto canvas and then painting over it and seeing what happens. And it's, it's a different ball game because it does change the uh, the way the tar behaves. Mm -hmm. So it's all it's all sort of in flux. But I, I have more confidence in the in the wooden support for the long term because most of what makes oil paintings vulnerable is the the the, um, the flexibility of the wooden supports pulling on the warping um, and you know changing the tension of the canvas. So things on wood, like the Mona Lisa, stand a better chance of lasting for the ages than things just on canvas on supports. So long answer, uh, but the short answer is, I don't know what works best. I'm trying everything. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Chris. And I know there's a couple of artists in the talk, so I'm sure they definitely wanted to learn about that. And, um, and it's fascinating to hear about artists' techniques. 
Um, I'm just wondering, you, you speak very eloquently or you write very eloquently, I should say, in, in your book, Loomings, um, about the, uh, what would you, how would you say, about the imperative of artists to continue to create at our time. And uh, I just wonder if you could maybe, you know, speak just a little bit to that. And then I know Marianne also has a question and I see Barbara has one too. So, yeah, <laughs> please. Thanks. Thank you. I, one of the things that, um, yeah, when I started learning about climate change, um, I considered myself a landscape painter, but my primary goal was to be expressive and to express, a real, I realized but in thinking about it that what artists do is express a relationship with a thing. Not so much just depict it, but depict a, an engagement with it. Uh, and that's what that's what's known as I think seeing as an artist. It it's vision, it's it's optical, but it's also a vision of the thing. There's an interior grasp that you try to express. And so a lot of my landscape paintings, which was primarily the kind of painting I am, paintings I did um, and do, are about an engagement with with the land. And I wanted it. I, I've always wanted that engagement to be honest. I don't want to repeat tropes that have been used before. I, uh, it's very difficult not to, especially if you're making a living a, as an artist. Um, and so it's a challenge. Uh, but when I started thinking about climate change, I, st I started seeing the land differently. I started saying, wait a minute, my relationship to nature has changed. It's no longer innocent. I felt like, I'm implicated in something now. I'm part of a society that is potentially destroying itself by destroying the planet, heedlessly uh, changing the actual chemistry of the world we evolved to inhabit. I mean, that's profound. And it, occurred, it, it became clear to me that's the most pressing uh, issue of our time. And I, I think that artists have a kind of moral responsibility at a certain point to to address the issues of their time, or at least all great artists seem to do so somehow. Um, like I saw this, I saw the, things really started to change. My relationship to art started to change when I saw the Goya exhibition at the MFA a few years ago. I realized the extent to which Goya was a, a social critic in his work, uh, as well as um, depicting his time, even his portraits, everything he seemed to do, it, it suddenly spoke to me and, I, and I, it, it became clear to me like, wow, that's what artists are supposed to do. They're supposed to express a vision of humanity, whether it's through a social lens or through an idealized, idealistic lens or a religious lens um, or a, you know, a humanistic lens. Artists are, artists are really supposed to be expressing something about humans relationship to ourselves and to the world. Um, and so, um, but what do you do if, what do you do if there's not even going to be a world? What if you do for a culture? If, I mean, I don't know if this is going to happen. Nobody does, but I've entertained the idea that society, that the culture that we've created could be upended within the next four or five decades. We could see mass migrations and huge shortages of resources that cause war and untold suffering. Uh, and you know, if, if everything is left unchecked, there's no question, we will destroy our culture. We will destroy society. Uh, the grid will go down. Um, I don't, I have, I have to be a little more optimistic and I have a little more faith that we are gonna uh, at least stop, you know, short of complete extinction, but things are going to get bad. They're going to get worse. And what is the relevance of, Art to that. Uh, it seemed to me that as this became a preoccupation to me, uh, my I could I couldn't go on anymore just making beautiful pictures. I couldn't even go on just expressing a an a, an awe in nature or an admiration of its beauty because it didn't wasn't honest. I knew that that I that's just not tenable. It seemed to me, um, and there's so there's. 
there's a um, precedent for this idea of that there's a moral responsibility of artists, a so maybe a social um, uh, responsibility. Um, even in in Shelley, you know, as, as a poet, uh, I, I often admired Shelley, and um, I went back to uh, his defense of poetry because he says that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world there. And it's a laughable phrase to some extent, but to, on the other hand, what he means is that art does matter. Uh, art does change minds and hearts in a way that science doesn't necessarily, or the way sometimes that um, the most strident you know, political movements fail to do as well. And moreover, as I said, that there, there's a kind of moral dimension to this. Here's a quote from Shelley, and this is, uh, this is part of one of the essays called, the essay called Redeeming Darkness in the, in the Looming's book. Shelley said, a man to be greatly good, to be greatly good, must imagine intensely and comprehensively. He must put himself in the place of another and of many others. The pains and pleasures of his species must become his own. So I felt that acutely that art has to go beyond just expressing my immediate feeling or my subjective uh, interpretation. For me, I, I have to put my, I have to consider my work, I think the artist has to consider their work um, public in a way. As soon as you start showing your work to other people rather than just keep it to yourself, it becomes a public act and you're, you're asking for a stage in a way, you're asking for to, uh, you're, you're saying something, you're asking for it to be heard. And so if you can put yourself in the place of another, then that work, your work can become a means of engagement rather than uh, socially uh, and transpersonally, rather than just a means of expression. And that to me uh, is a very tantalizing idea. I, I, uh, and, and a comforting one too, in a dark time, art can do that or can reach across the abyss and cut through the noise and create can real connection on a, on a social and, and macro social level. I'm, so I'm, I'm interested in that, in taking up that challenge. It feels good to me. It gives me a mission. A lot of the, a lot of the years I was, I was painting, um, it, I, I loved, I'd fall, fall and fell in love with painting and there's so much to learn and know. Um, but at, at, once I kind of settled into a style uh, and sort of started to become known for it, I began asking myself, why am I doing this? You know, what, because my style was, was pleasing, uh, but it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't truly expressive of who I am. Even as a teenager, I was very dubious, uh, very suspicious of the American dream. You know, growing up on Long Island, uh, the site of suburban sprawl, I, I, uh, I was very cynical as a, even as a teenager. And they say cynics are frustrated romantics. And I think that's true. I mean, part, part of me wants to just be one with everything. Uh, and another part of me just looks at, at all we've done to make that impossible. And we're in that, that's the position I see humanity in. And I want to, to my work to, if I want my work to be really true to who I am, that's what it needs to say. And Melville's helped me say that. Wow. Goya helped me say that. Thank you, thank you, Chris. And I just have to put out there for those of you who did, aren't, didn't really catch that, not only, um, Chris should not just be quoting Shelley. His words and his essays in the book Loomings are really beautiful. And as you can see, he's very eloquent and impassioned in stating how, you know, art can actually reach across the abyss, which we, we do so, so need now. I, I see that Barbara O'Brien has a question and I know that Marianne does as well. So Barbara, please unmute yourself and ask and then Marianne, you can hop right in after that. Great. Um, so I grew up as a reader and I think it's one of the best gifts my parents ever gave to me. Um, I'm also a tall ship sailor. So I've been around the world and I've been on other voyages on a three-masted tall ship. And um, Chris is one of my teachers and I absolutely adore him. And I recently heard that Patrick O'Brien, the um, writer, 
never was on a sailboat. And I'm amazed that he's able to write about that. And Chris, I don't think you've ever been on a three-masted bark in the middle of the ocean with just the night sky, but you've <laughs> captured that. Um, you've captured the reward and the risk that I experienced on my voyage. I mean, we weren't chasing whales, but um, you know, you have the storms and the people on board, and then you have this beautiful night with the southern sky. And I think the um, the gold leaf paintings just absolutely speak to my heart. I just love mm. them. So how do you, I, you know, I'm sure you lived Moby Dick as you worked on this series, but how do you capture that without having been out at sea and hating everybody on board? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, maybe I can appeal to Jung here and talk about archetypes because there's a continuity here between, you know, the, the ship being on a ship, reading about, you know, being on a ship and what Melville does with being on a ship and my own relationship to the water. You know, I grew up on Long Island next to, in Oyster Bay, next to the bay. And I spent a lot of time walking up and down that shore thinking and feeling oceanic thoughts as it were, you know? Um, I think that there's something so just primal and archetypal about the ship on the ocean that we feel, whether they're actually on a ship or whether we're dreaming of being on a ship through literature or through art, it's, you know, what is the ocean to us? What is the, it's vastness. And so is the sky, vastness. And there's our, our little bark, as you say, you know, trolling along, um, trying to make sense of it, trying to stay above water. That's humanity. You know, and I think we can all res we all respond to that on the, on the on some deep level, even though the surface details may be different. It's a very real and human uh, uh, bedrock experience. I think the human among the vast. Good question, Marianne. Yeah, I, I have a few observations um, and questions, but I I do also want to encourage um, others who are on the call who may have um, a question to to please step forward um, before me. Um, so I just want to pause for a moment in case there's someone um, who would like to ask something. Or you can think about a question and I'll just barge ahead. Um, I just want to share with everyone what, what I'm observing from the bookshop, uh, people being so drawn to your work, Christopher, uh, as if pulled by magnetic force. I, I, you know, we've had, we've had artwork in the shop before. Um, I've never seen the reactions that I'm seeing with your work. So uh, there's something very powerful going on, um, whether the person has necessarily read the book or not. So your powers of expression are coming through this. To me, I'm not a painter, but a, a medium of tar, which I imagine is nearly impossible to work with. I, I know that you are thinning it to a certain degree, um, but I can't really imagine how you um, maintain some kind of control with it. Otherwise, I, I so appreciated um, learning about some of your artistic influences and, and some of those are, are evident in the work uh, clearly, but I love the way you're um, you know, certainly not afraid to juxtapose your works against these great masters um, and say you're informed by them and, and transforming and moving beyond them in, um, in very different and exciting ways uh, with Ryder, with Turner, uh, the Jackson Pollock connection. I 
saw right away with that Corpus uh, Sancti piece so strongly and so powerfully. Um, let me just actually ask a question. Uh, I, I know that you have taught. I'm wondering, are you teaching now? And in particular, have you attempted to teach Moby Dick to students at any time along the way? Uh, that's interesting. No, I haven't. Um, I have been teaching working in series, though. I used to be a very, um, uh, well, I used to do a lot of plein air painting, painting out of doors directly from nature. And that was a wonderful way of painting to teach as well, because we would I could gather people together, we go tramping out into marshes and barber knows. Uh, and this was very fun. Um, but as I've come to immerse myself in this series and in other series as that other series that I'm working on, I've, I've become a serial painter, I guess. I mean, now this is the way I paint. I, I find a series and I go after it. Uh, and I'm doing less and less uh, plein air painting while I still enjoy it. So I've been teaching. I, I, so I, I, my teaching has to reflect my, my practice. So I've developed a class called Working in Series that I share with students. So I share the, the process that I've gone through and I try to jumpstart it in my students as well uh, through various means. Um, so I had, I've taught, I, that's the last, uh, last class I taught was in uh, July on the Cape. I teach at the Truro Center for the Arts in, uh, or Castle Hill Center for the Arts in Truro. And I'm also teaching, I should be teaching again uh, at Concord Center for the Arts in Concord, Mass. Uh, again, a um, working in series class there. So I'm not teaching any literature. Um, I, I did teach art history for a few years as I transitioned from being a writer to being a full-time painter. Uh, but uh, I, I, yeah, so my, my painting is, I mean, my teaching is, is just independent uh, mostly through just little art art organizations and through my own contacts with with students. So it's it you know what you said, Marianne, about um, looking to masters, you know, and, and being influenced by them. It can feel you know intimidating and it can feel pretentious, but uh, I urge my students to do that as well. I think that the best way to become a, a true, a true artist is to look at master artists and, and not just look at their work for their technique, while that may be important, but to really look at their lives and how the life intertwines with the work and how the work evolves over time. You get a sense of how artists cultivate their, their talent around passionate ideas and concerns. And so that's what I'm taking from these these guys as well. You know, what I love about Turner is the ethereal in his work. And the, so some painters would say his use of light, but I see it as a kind of uh, allegory for spiritual experience. It's like he's dissolving the material world into the immaterial. Uh, and so, you know, to, to, to put yourself up against these guys, I think it's it's use it's helpful to for for one's own growth, not to say I'm in a league with them or anything. Obviously, but it it gives you goals, it gives you a model, it shows you what you can, what painting can be or what any art can be, and it makes you it makes you higher, even if you fail to to live up to the ideal. You'll have gotten further than you ever would have by simply keeping your head in the sand or, and not looking. So that's, that's kind of why I urge my students too, to find a, find a master, you know, preferably a dead one. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you. Your, your students must be very lucky to work with you. So thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's fantastic, uh, Chris. And I'm sure people here who might want to take your classes can go to your website and find out about that them would that be correct yep there's a there's a tab for for teaching yeah or or send me an email too and i because i have a list of uh, folks who are interested in classes i'm not great at updating my website so 
if you send me an email, chris at christophervolpe.com, which you'll find on the website, christophervolpe.com, um, I'll put you on this email list that goes out to uh, the folks who are interested in classes and let you know when I'm, what I'm offering when. Thank you, thank you. And um, so I see also that Elaine has a question. So why don't we ask Elaine to unmute herself and, and please ask your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, so my question is, are there other literary works that you could see yourself creating art in conversation with? That's a great question. That's a great question. Because I've been asking myself that. <laughs> um, and the answer is yes. Uh, I thought about Thoreau because I go by the Concord River, the, I mean, the Merrimack he wrote, he, he, that he wrote on and wrote about and go by it every day, I teach in Concord. So Thoreau is a presence and I've read Thoreau since I was a teenager and been enthralled with him. That's my romantic idealistic side, right? So I wanted to do something, I thought I'd like eventually to do something with, with Thoreau. Um, closer to my home as right and now, which is New Hampshire, is, I was thinking about Robert Frost as well. And he has, a, he has a wonderful poem called, um, I think it's called Spring Pools. And it's about the vernal pools that appear in New England woods during springtime, uh, which, where, which are uh, actually a whole, uh, are studied these days as a whole micro ecosystem. There's species of frogs and salamanders and, and f other uh, fauna and flora that only live and reproduce because of these vernal pools that come up. So I've had it, I've had an idea for a series um, around the the poem by Robert Frost, Spring Pools, and maybe using some of the some of the the, the lines from that poem as titles for some of these these paintings. Um, but they're they're going to have to be a very different kind of painting than the Looming's paintings. They're going to have to be. I'm going to have to go back to color for one thing. <laughs> so. But yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, Hawthorne is another great writer and Poe, nineteenth-century, you know, writers who have faced darkness in their work that I'm also fascinated with, and I'd I'd love to do something like that. When I first started painting, actually, I, I this tells you how how steeped in American literature I am. I identified with the protagonist in the Fall of the House of Usher, who painted you know, he Usher. Poe describes Usher painting and painting these kind of odd, you know, surreal paintings. And even then, you know, the third or fourth painting I ever did was an attempt to create a painting that Usher would have painted. So, uh, and that was in 2007. So it's been, uh, I, there's another full circle thing. So yeah, the relationship to literature and painting. I would love to see some ecstatic paintings based on Whitman's Leaves of Grass. That would be really something too. Wow, all good, all good possibilities, Chris. We're gonna look forward to seeing who you choose to work with, uh, with next. Um, you know, I think at this point, maybe we'll just, those are all the questions. We'll uh, thank everybody for, for joining us. And um, I'd like to, give people just a little more information about the marathon, if you don't mind, before we unmute ourselves and, and clap for you. Uh, we hope everyone here can join the marathon if you live locally, or at least if you don't, to join the film that we're showing and the talk back on September 1. But the marathon on September 10th to 12th will feature Harris Eulin, who will perform Father Mapple's sermon. Uh, we'll have Laurie Anderson, the avant-garde musician, and she will do the quarter deck chapter. And lots of other things will happen. And we're, we're very hopeful this time, this year, to start off with a blessing from um, our Shinnecock neighbors who, on whose land we actually are graced to live. The Shinnecock Nation is on the east end of Long Island. And so to find out more, you can take a look at the link that I just dropped into the chat. Uh, if you want to sign up to read, the link is there to do that as well. And the marathon is a fundraiser for our nonprofit, Canio's Cultural Cafe, an educational nonprofit. And if you can, we would appreciate your looking into sponsoring a chapter uh, for the marathon. And finally, we are on bookshop.org for those of you who know of that. And if you don't, it's a great new online bookstore that supports small independents around the country. 
So check them out as well. But uh, Christopher, you know, just thank you so much for bringing your your passion, your wisdom, your talent to us this evening. Um, we we wish you well with your future endeavors, and we do hope that when the show comes down, either the 16th or the 17th, that Christopher may actually be here in the bookstore, uh, and and to meet and greet people. Um, so stay tuned for that. We don't have that set yet, but we hope that it will be possible for people to come into the store and, uh, and, and chat with Christopher. So if you wanna unmute yourselves right now and give Christopher a really warm thank you for his time, uh, please do so. That's great. Thank you. I just wanna echo what Catherine said. Um, the work is so extraordinary. Christopher, we are honored to have it uh, on the walls at Canio's Books. It couldn't be a more perfect uh, connection, collaboration. Um, so we're really thrilled that, that you reached out and uh, are so enjoying getting to live with the work every day. So um, we look forward to, to seeing you when you come down. Thank okay. you again for tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Be creative. Keep, keep those creative energies going. That's, you know, that will lead us forward. <laughs>